Right now in many parts of the United States, there's an ammunition shortage going on. Depending on where you are and what type of ammunition you're looking for, it can be scarce, whether that's in the local stores or online. Some types of ammunition, like 12 gauge low base birdshot, are still plentiful in the local stores, but other types of ammunition like 223 Remington, 5.56 NATO, 9x19, 45 ACP, the list goes on, can be difficult to get. Recently I ordered some ammunition online and I got an email with a projected ship date, then about a week later they sent me another email telling me that that projected ship date had been pushed back by a few weeks. About a week after that they sent me another email telling me that that projected ship date had been pushed back by a few more weeks. Depending on where you are in the country and what type of ammunition you're trying to find, ammo can be scarce. Because of that, recently a lot of people have contacted me asking about firearms training techniques during an ammunition shortage. So here we are. Today will be my top five tips for firearms training during an ammunition shortage. And as usual, it comes with a list of caveats, disclaimers, and yabbits. The first one being that I am not trying to give you any advice. I am not trying to tell you what to do. I'm only going to discuss and demonstrate the techniques that I'm going to use. Secondly, Today's presentation is not designed for an audience that just bought their first firearm last month. Today's presentation is designed for an audience that's been doing firearms training for a while. And third, today we're dealing with the reality that ammunition can be scarce and training techniques that deal with that. We are not dealing with the political or social ramifications or causes of that shortage. So please do not clutter the comments section with comments about what politician is to blame for this, and pointing fingers at whose fault this is, or discussing how much Uncle Joe reminds you of Uncle Joe. So with that, let's get to firearms training. And first I want to discuss that firearms training can mean different things to different people. Let me see if I can illustrate my point. For a lot of people, firearms training might look something like this. Yes, I know. Look familiar? As were for others, firearms training might look something more like this. See the difference? So we see there's a difference between grandpa slow fire and actual firearms training with presentations, rapid target acquisition, reload drills, weak hand drills, and so on. 
And for those of us who've moved to that level of training, there are some things that can be done to help that training process when ammunition is scarce. Number one on my list is shoot less. Use less ammo. Okay, that seems kind of obvious, but let me show you what I mean. When I talk about using less ammunition, there could be many applications for that, but number one is during reloading drills. Many people will shoot till they're empty, reload, shoot till they're empty. And if you're concentrating on a reloading drill, it is a good idea when possible to fire that last round, reload, then reacquire the target and shoot again and make that part of the drill. But you don't necessarily need to empty the firearm. Right now I've got my Smith & Wesson Model 36 loaded with four empty casings and one live round. I'll shoot that one round, then use my speed loader, reacquire the target, and only shoot one more round. I can still practice reacquiring the target doing my reload drill, but I don't necessarily have to use all that ammunition. The concept also applies with autoloaders. When I'm doing a magazine change drill, I don't have to empty the whole magazine. I can shoot one shot, reload, acquire the target, and shoot one more shot. Or if you'd like to run the pistol completely empty until the slide locks back, you can do that too. just depends on how many rounds you choose to put in your magazine. So point one on my list is use less ammo, especially during mag change drills. And remember that you can do mag change and speed loader drills with dummy ammunition. But also part of using less ammo is changing your mindset from the mindset that mag dumps are fun to the mentality that your ammunition has become a lot more valuable, both in the sense that the price has gone up significantly and in the sense that whatever ammo you have is going to be more difficult to replace. Now point two on my list is, when possible, use different firearms that can utilize ammunition that's more available and less expensive than what you typically use. Let me show you what I mean. When I say using firearms that can utilize more available, less expensive ammunition, there's many examples. Let me show you what I would consider an almost perfect one. This is my Beretta 92FS caliber 9x19. This is my Beretta M922 caliber 22 long rifle. In terms of disassembly, reassembly, form, and function, these two handguns are virtually identical. Because the magazines on the 22 are not exactly like the magazines on the 9mm, it's not perfectly analogous for mag change drills, but there is a drill for which this handgun is very beneficial. Let me show you what I mean. If you have a double action revolver, then your trigger pull is the same every time. If you have a striker action auto like a Glock or a Smith & Wesson M&P, then your trigger pull is the same every time. But for a double to single action auto loader like the Beretta or many different models of SIG, your first and second trigger pulls are very different. And doing a two shot drill is an important drill to do. And the Beretta M922 allows me to do that without burning up expensive and hard to find 9mm ammo. And again, the mag change drill on this is not identical to the 9mm, but at least it can help for other types of drills. Let's take a look at the target. Not bad, and a lot less expensive than 9x19 ammo. So the Beretta M922 is an almost perfect training aid for the Beretta 92FS. We also have presentations featuring the Glock 44 and the Smith & Wesson M&P 22. Now sometimes the training aid you have available won't be a perfect analog. For example, the Smith & Wesson Model 63 caliber 22 long rifle with an 8-shot cylinder is hardly the perfect analog for the Smith & Wesson Model 2944 Magnum, or the Smith & Wesson Model 15 and 38 Special or the Smith & Wesson 638 and 38 Special. But it's still a double action revolver. It has a trigger pull similar to these other revolvers. You still have to push the cylinder release forward, push the cylinder out of battery, one sharp slap. 
it can be a good training aid. Over here, the Ruger 1022 is hardly analogous to an AR platform rifle, but it's still a rifle, it's still auto-loading, you can have aftermarket high-capacity magazines, it can be a good training aid. Now, I've got my Marlin lever action 30-30 rifle. Well, you might say that the Henry lever action rifle and caliber 22 long rifle isn't exactly analogous, but it's still lever action. You still have to remember to lower the hammer, put it on half cock. It can be a good training aid. Even this Gamo Whisper 2 pellet gun in caliber 177 can be a good training aid, although it is hardly analogous to any other rifle I own. When I shoot it, I still have to practice sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, breath control, stance. And it can be good to train on those things. Let's shoot it. So the target's out there about 25 yards. And the way this pellet gun works, pull the barrel down and cock it. Put a pellet in the chamber. Got to make sure you put the pellet in the right direction. Close it. And the safety is this lever in front of the trigger. Push it forward. doesn't make very much noise, but it has a surprisingly high amount of recoil for a pellet gun. And again, although this is not analogous to any other rifle I own, while shooting it, I do have to apply sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, breath control stance. and we'll shoot one more shot. And let's take a look at the target. And here's our group. So point one on my list, use less ammo. Point two on my list, do some training with firearms that can utilize ammunition that's more available and less expensive than what you typically use. Point three on my list is dry fire training. Dry fire training is just looking at a target with your firearm completely unloaded, practicing sight alignment, sight picture, trigger control, breath control stance without using any ammo. You can incorporate dry fire training into presentation drills. Now when it comes to dry fire training, many people have many different opinions. Some people are of the opinion that you should never dry fire, it can damage your firearm. Some people are of the opinion you can dry fire anything anytime and it won't hurt anything. Those two opinions are diametrically opposed. My opinion is that the truth and the facts are somewhere in the middle. And remember that my opinion is based on my training, my education, my experience. Different people have different experiences, so they have different opinions. Now, when it comes to dry fire, there are certain types of firearms that, in my opinion, should not be dry fired. From the time that I was a kid, and I mean a little kid, I have always been taught that firearms, like this lever-action Marlin 3030 and this bolt-action Ruger 338 Winchester Magnum, 
typical hunting rifles like that should never be dry fired. That's something that I have always learned, something I've always heard, and it's something I practice. Now, I'm sure I'm going to be contacted by someone who tells me that he knew this guy who 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 knew this guy's cousin that dry fired his 30-30 all the time and never heard anything. Well, that's great for you and your cousin, but I'm not going to dry fire those type of rifles. Now, on the other side of that, Rifles like this AR platform can be dry fired again and again without any damage. Dry fire practice was a big part of what we did in the military. I've dry fired AR platform rifles thousands of times. I've seen it done tens of thousands of times. I've never seen a broken firing pin. Now another type of firearm that I do not dry fire are single shot or double barreled shotguns, whether they're internal hammer or hand numbers exposed. Again, I'm sure there's lots of people who've done it without damage, but I'm not going to do it. Now, when it comes to handguns, conventional single action or double to single action auto loaders, virtually all of them can be dry fired without any problem at all. Striker action auto loaders as well. When it comes to revolvers, there's different types of double action revolvers. Some will have a hammer-mounted firing pin, like the Smith & Wesson Model 15. When I pull the trigger, the firing pin hits the primer and goes off. When I release the trigger, the hammer moves itself back. It's a rebounding hammer. Some double-action revolvers will have a frame-mounted firing pin. Now, this Ruger SP-101 has a frame-mounted firing pin and a transfer bar safety system. When I pull the trigger, the hammer hits the transfer bar, the transfer bar hits the firing pin, the firing pin hits the primer and off it goes. When I release the trigger, the transfer bar falls out of safety. That's your safety system, so the hammer's not actually resting on the firing pin. Now the Smith & Wesson Model 638, it has a frame-mounted firing pin and a rebounding hammer. And when I pull the trigger, your frame-mounted firing pin hits the primer. When I release the trigger, your hammer again pops back, although it's hard to see on this, this shrouded hammer. When it comes to shooting double-action revolvers and single-action revolvers, pretty much all of them can safely be dry-fired, provided that they are center-fire firearms. This Smith & Wesson Model 63 has a frame-mounted firing pin and a rebounding hammer but it's in caliber 22 long rifle. And that's different than center fire firearms. What's going on inside the firearm is, with a center fire firearm, your firing pin hits the primer, it goes off. If that chamber is empty, the firing pin doesn't hit anything. With rim fires, like calibers like 22 long rifle or 22 Winchester Magnum, that firing pin has to hit the rim. Now when the chamber is loaded and your hard steel firing pin hit your soft brass rim, no problem. But if the chamber is empty, your hard steel firing pin might hit your hard steel edge of your chamber and it can damage your firearm. You'll see this a lot on 22 long rifle revolvers. When you look at the chambers and you can see at the edge of every chamber is a dent where somebody has been dry firing a 22 he shouldn't dry fire. Now there are no dents in this handgun. I've dry fired it a lot. As far as I know, it can be dry fired just fine. I used to have a Dan Wesson Model 22 and caliber 22 long rifle. Dry fired it thousands of times, no damage. But there are some types of 22s that shouldn't be dry fired. On that list are guns like my Marlin Model 60, my Ruger 1022, and my Henry Lever Action. I'm sure there are many people of the opinion that those firearms can be dry fired, but I'm not going to. And again, remember that I'm not trying to tell you what to do, I'm only demonstrating what I'm doing. If I were to give any advice on dry firing, it would be, if you're in doubt, if possible, contact the manufacturer and see what they tell you. Number four on my list is doing drills that do not require live fire. Now that might sound the same thing as dry fire training, and it is an extension of it. But I want to point out that when you're using a firearm for competitive target shooting, or hunting, or anti-personnel purposes, there are two things that are of paramount importance. 
One, that you hit what you're shooting at while at the same time not hitting what you're not shooting at. And two, that your firearm goes off when you want it to, but doesn't go off when you don't want it to. Because those two things are of paramount importance, we tend to train a lot on safety procedures and range procedures and shooting at targets. But when we do that, other things get neglected, and there are a lot more things that go into firearms training, such as disassembly, cleaning, reassembly. That's part of your firearm going off when you want it to and not when you don't want it to. There's also things such as presentations from the holster. That can require a lot of work. Now, side note, I just pointed my firearm at an unmanned camera on a live fire range hundreds or thousands of miles away from you and not in real time. So if that really distressed you, I have to remind you that today's presentation is not intended for beginners. But when I talk about bringing the pistol out of the holster, that is something you have to work on and getting it back into the holster and getting it secured while still looking downrange. And now might be a really good time to work on things like that. And not just your forward presentation, but also your 90 degree presentation. And yes, when you do that from the other direction, it is a different drill. There's something else that gets neglected, partially because people neglect it, partially because ranges don't like it when you do this, but the 180 degree presentation. Now, there are many different ways to do that, and I make no claim that mine is the best. It's just what works for me. But there's a couple of things that I want to point out. First, when you do this presentation, you do not bring your pistol out and cover half of the earth before you get on target. When you do this, your pistol stays down until you're turned around. And if you do this correctly, it will put you in a different position than where you started out. And this is something to work on. Also, while ammunition is scarce, now might be a good time to work on things like this in the field. And you might discover that doing such things on grass and uneven ground and in the snow may be a little more difficult than on pavement or on the nice level gravel range. Now is also a good time to work on being able to manipulate your firearm and your holster when your hands are very cold or when you're wearing gloves or perhaps wearing clothing that's a little heavier than what you normally would. Now a while ago I talked about doing reload drills. Well not just speed reloads but also tactical reloads. Being able to get your magazine out of your mag pouch and retain that magazine. Now when I do that you may notice that my mag pouches are on the side and you may think that I'd be able to get that mag out better if those mag pouches were in the front and that's correct they would be however when my mag pouches are in the front they get in my way when trying to do a kneeling presentation and these are the kind of things that you discover when you work with your gear in the field and now while ammunition is scarce might be a really good time to get into the field and work on things like this. Okay, it's getting late and we're losing light. I want to get to point five, which is the last point on my list. However, before I get to point five, it comes with two disclaimers. First, I am not trying to say I told you so. That is not helpful, that is not constructive, and I'm not trying to do that. Although some of what I'm about to say might sound that way, so please bear with me. Secondly, when there's an ammunition shortage, people hoarding ammunition, buying ammunition in very large quantities, going into the store and buying all kinds of ammo, sometimes when they don't even have the gun to shoot it, those kind of activities are in part what creates and sustains the ammunition shortage. And yes, I'm aware of that. So those things haven't been said. Point five on my list is to make timely and correct ammunition choices. Now, a long time ago in the military, I heard this Thing where they say, in the field, never stand up if you could be sitting down, never sit down if you could be lying down, and never be awake if you could be asleep, because you don't know when you'll have the next chance to take a nap or even sit down. And that mentality applies to buying ammunition right now. Let's say you have a pistol in caliber 9x19, you go into the gun store, and you see they have four boxes of 9mm ammo. Well, right now, gun stores, when they get ammunition in, it gets sold very quickly. 
and you look at those four boxes and you think, well, I still have 500 round, maybe I don't need to. No, buy it, because you never know when you'll have the next chance to buy it. And I would say, if they have four boxes, please buy three of them, leave at least one for somebody else. But making those timely purchases, buying it right now, even though you might perceive you might not need it at this particular minute, does not mean make desperation choices. Some particular stores, especially pawn shops that also sell guns, I've seen that they have doubled or even tripled their ammunition prices. Don't pay those exorbitant prices if you can at all help it. Also remember that a lot of smaller gun stores, their wholesale prices have gone up. So don't get mad at people at small gun stores like Garner's because their prices have gone up, their wholesale prices have gone up, and they can't sell the ammunition at a loss. Also, there are times where I say that something will be better than nothing. Sometimes that's not altogether true. Recently I did a presentation on the Taurus TX-22 22 long rifle pistol, and one of the ammunitions I used was Federal American Eagle 22 long rifle, and it was of extremely poor quality. That's one of those cases that I would say having that might not be better than nothing. So even though ammunition is scarce, don't make desperation purchases. Make timely and correct purchases. Another thing is, don't fall into the obscure caliber mentality. Now, let me see if I can explain that. Right now in the United States, by far the most popular gauge of shotgun is 12 gauge. 20 gauge is what I would call a distant second. 410 is by far a distant third. 16 gauge is way behind that. And 28 gauge has fallen so far out of favor that although the guns and ammo are still available, a lot of people have never even heard of 28 gauge. But when I go to the store to buy 12 gauge ammunition, if you're looking for buckshot or slugs, that might be quite a search. But in most places, you're still gonna be able to find low base birdshot for 12 gauge. In some places, ammunition is just pretty well gone. But as I look through the store, if I look closely, I'll find a few boxes of 28 gauge. And there's always someone who will say, see, instead of buying a 12 gauge or a 20 gauge, you should have bought a 28 gauge because there will always be ammunition available for that. Another example is that in terms of handguns that people use for concealed carry, personal protection, home defense, there's many calibers, but here in the United States, there's a few that are by far the most popular. And in no particular order, they would be calibers like 380 ACP, 9x19, 38 Special, 357 Magnum, 40 Smith & Wesson, 45 ACP, and maybe a few others. And right now, finding ammunition in those calibers can be very difficult. But when I go to a store and they have virtually no handgun ammo, quite often I'll find one lonely box of 32 ACP. And there are those who will say, see, instead of getting a 9 or a 40, you should have gotten a 32 because there will always be ammunition available for that. Okay. What I would say is, instead of buying a 32, go ahead and buy the 9 or the 40 or whichever one you like that's a popular caliber, and then get a good supply of ammunition a year ago. Instead of buying a 28 gauge, get a 12 gauge or a 20 if you prefer, and then get a decent supply of ammunition a year ago. There are some people, they want to hedge their bets. They'll say, okay, I'll buy a 12 gauge and a 20 gauge and a 410 bore and maybe even something else. So no matter what's at the store, I'll always have something to shoot it. Okay, I would say instead of doing that, buy a 12 gauge, and then the money you would have spent on those other guns, use that money to buy 12 gauge ammo a year ago. And I know that sounds like I told you so, but that's a point I really want to make. Now, saying things like that might not be helpful in this current situation, but you still have to make timely and correct ammunition choices. Now, there are some people that because they do handgun hunting and they have a concealed handgun permit, and maybe they shoot in different types of handgun competitions, maybe they're just collectors, they'll have a variety of handguns, and they'll have a 357 and a 40 and a 45 and a 9x19. And for those people, right now, they have some different choices that they can make. They perhaps can make use of the 32. 
Now I do have a 9x19 and I have a 32 ACP because circumstances are such that I have both of those. But I don't think it would have been wise to forego the 9 and get the 32 just so someday I might find that one box of ammunition. And I don't think buying every different type of gun there is is really practical unless you have uses for all those guns to begin with. Another thing is, a lot of people who have the different types of guns will feel the need to, I need to get ammo for this and that and this. Right now, buy what's available when you can get it. But I would also say, pick those firearms you're going to use the most and concentrate on getting that ammo, if you can. So let's recap. Number one, use less ammo. Number two, do subcal training. Number three, dry fire practice. Number four, do all those drills that do not require live fire. And number five, make timely and correct ammunition choices. So as always, don't try this at home and what you call a professional. And thanks for watching my top five tips for training when ammunition is scarce video.